As you heard the Old Testament lesson today, what you might have imagined it looking like is this. What is that a picture of? It's a courtroom. And what is that first seat that's right there? That's the witness stand. And that's exactly what Isaiah is trying to get us to imagine in our minds when we have our Old Testament lesson today. It's a courtroom scene, and it's a, it's a civil case, and the plaintiff is suing the defendant. The defendant are the people and the gods of Babylon, and the, acu- and the, pla- and the plaintiff is the one true God, and his witnesses are the people of Israel. As God begins the trial, he makes an opening statement. He says, I am the first, I am the last, there is no one like me, let him proclaim it if he is, there is no God other than me. And what do the defendants say in response to that? Well, they didn't say anything in our Old Testament lesson, and they still would be able to say nothing because they are literally gods of stone, gods of gold. Gods of the imagination, gods of the fairy tales of the mind. So because of that, God calls his first witness. And his first witness is the people of Israel. Now this courtroom scene is all happening while the people of Israel, they're sitting in exile. They have been faithless towards God, so God punished them by sending them off into exile into Babylon. So the whole crowd of this courtroom, they're all against the people of Israel. And as Israel walks up to the courtroom stand, they're all saying, your so-called God, he allowed you to be captured. He's not all powerful. He's not all loving. He's not merciful. In fact, he really hates you because no God would let you suffer all of that. And that's why you're here. So Israel, as they sit there, they're afraid. And as they sit there, they look around. And they see the images of the gods of the world around them. Apsu, Tiamat, Marduk, and the like. And Israel is scared. And then Yahweh the God of Israel, he comes up to the witness stand and he says a quiet word to Israel. As they're sitting there and they're about to testify to the truth, God goes up to Israel and he says, don't be afraid. Don't worry. You've got this. You know what you've seen. You know what you've heard. Just tell the truth. And let the truth speak for itself. Because you are my witnesses. When you think of a witness in a courtroom setting, I came across this definition that seems to sum it up really well. The word witness denotes a person who has seen or heard something that is objectively true. Because what does a witness have to do when they get up to the witness stand? They put their hand on the Bible and they say, do you declare to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So... The witness has to tell the truth. They have to, and the truth that Israel had to proclaim was what made their God unique. So Israel, as they're sitting there, they're thinking about it. What makes my God unique? What makes Yahweh different than Apsu or Tiamat or Marduk? And they probably came up with many, many answers, but I'll give you two or three just to keep your mind straight. Who, what other God would call a random guy out of the middle of nowhere, 800 miles away, and say, come over here, and I'm going to give you and your family a blessing a number of generations in the future? I'm talking about Abraham here. What other God could do that and make it happen? None. Or what other God could, at the same time, save thousands of people and kill thousands of other people while they walk through the middle of a sea. 
Of course, I'm talking about the Red Sea and the Exodus. None. Or what other god could give a mortal king the promise that his reign will last forever and ever and ever regardless? Amen. Of course, I'm talking about David here. None. No imaginary God could do that. And that is what Israel was to testify. There is no other God like the God of Israel. None existed before him, and none would outlast him. So the people of Israel, they heard Isaiah's message. They heard, you are my witnesses. And you know what they did? They witnessed. Think about some of the great stories that we hear about in the Bible of people who witnessed in Babylon. Think of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You remember that story? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are told that they have to bow down to a false god, and they don't. And they even go to a fiery furnace. Why? They are witnesses to the truth of the one true God. They were willing to die for their faith because they knew the truth would win out at the end of the day. Or what about Daniel? Daniel was told that the, everybody had to pray to King Darius. And Daniel, he went into his room, into the upper room where there was a window so everybody could see it, and he prayed toward Jerusalem where God dwelled, and he was arrested and thrown into a lion's den. Why? Because he was a witness, and he knew that the truth would win out in the end. Now, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. I'm moving away from the Old Testament lesson and more towards application for what it means for you today. Um, And as I do, I want you to remember a very famous Shakespeare quote. It comes from the comedy As You Like It. Maybe you've heard it before. All the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. Does that sound familiar? Well, I'm going to take that phrase all the world's a stage and all the men and women are merely players. And I'm going to change it a little bit for our sermon today. And my message for you today is not that all the world is a stage, but instead that all the world is a courtroom and all the men and women are merely witnesses. You are the witness sitting on the stand. Now, much has been said about the decline of Christianity in the Western world. It's left a lot of people afraid, scared of what's going to happen to the church, scared of what's going to happen to the message of Jesus Christ in the coming generations. But the truth is, this is nothing new. In fact, this is exactly what Isaiah was dealing with in his day. Like Isaiah's time, we as the church are in the minority right now. Like Isaiah's time, faithful people are dispersed throughout all the world and not gathered together as one, as God wants us to be. Like Isaiah's time, We are the church that is scattered among the many gods of this world that has many options. We are the church in the midst of the weeds, to use the image from our gospel lesson today. And now, because we are the church in the midst of the weeds, God calls us to come and bear witness to the truth. Now, I've watched my fair share of courtroom dramas. I have a little bit of a penchant to watch as many episodes of Law & Order as I really want to. And I um, can tell you from watching all of these courtroom dramas that it's typically a high-stakes affair. And the witnesses, when they're about to be called up to the witness stand, they're scared. They're afraid. 
They've been told by their perpetrators that they're living a lie and that, are there, that the lie is the truth and that nothing can drown that out. So what do the, the attorneys have to do for the witnesses? They have to prepare them. And oftentimes when it comes down to, in those courtroom dramas, preparing the witnesses, it comes down to saying one particular thing, and that is just tell the truth. And the truth is going to win out at the end of the day. We are called as witnesses in a courtroom drama. In our courtroom drama, the philosophies and religions of this world seem greener and stronger and more persuasive than the Christian faith. Atheism seems more credible. Absolute tolerance seems more compelling. Moralist, moralistic pluralism, that is, every idea is good as long as you believe it, is more convincing now than ever. These false truths and half lies have been spoken into your ears for a generation and they continue to be spoken to this day so that when you walk out of this church you will hear people say things like your version of Christianity that's old-fashioned your version of Christianity that's outdated your God the one that you think you know he's not all loving he's not all merciful he's hateful and vengeful and you've got to deal with that if I'm being told that I would be scared wouldn't you it's easy in that situation when you hear those words to be scared and to be silent but that's where Isaiah informs our witness today because like Isaiah's time where God calls Israel to be his witnesses today Jesus calls you to be his witnesses Jesus is walking beside you as you are walking to sit at that witness stand and he's telling you don't be afraid don't be scared is there any other god beside me you know the truth just tell the truth and nothing will get in the way and so jesus speaks to us through through himself to tell us what is true he tells us what is good right and holy that there is no God and no philosophy that is able to stand up to the Christian faith and this is the witness that we are to give it comes to us from first Corinthians chapter 15 this is one of the strongest witnesses of the Christian faith for I delivered to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. Our witness this day is that Christ is risen. <laughs> Thank you, Connie. We're, let's try that again we're gonna try that and we're gonna see how well you do with it our witness in the world today is that Christ is risen yeah. he's risen indeed hallelujah knowing this enables you to speak to the false truths and half lies that you hear in this world can nihilism this idea that nothing is true and nothing matters can that save you no only Christ can save you can Allah forgive sins no only Jesus can forgive sins can Buddha hear and respond to your prayers no no one there's no God like our God and it this might not be a popular opinion but Jesus tells us to speak it and he says in Mark chapter 13 don't be anxious huh sounds like the Old Testament lesson there doesn't it don't be anxious beforehand what you are to say but whatever is given to you in that hour speak it for it is not you who speak but it is the Holy Spirit who speaks through you we are witnesses of Christ's resurrection in the world today and on the surface it seems like the cards are stacked against us but we know the truth and nothing can drown out that truth 
and we let the truth speak for itself. When people say, your God's not loving, he hates you, you can say, you're right, he does hate my sin. He hates every bit of my sin. Nevertheless, I have a God who loves me so much that he sent his son into this world to die when I should have died. And guess what? He's alive. And he says, peace be with you. And because of that, I know I am forgiven. And faith in this fact, in this fact alone, gives me life. And this is what is being proclaimed to me day after day and week after week. Every time I read the scriptures, every time I remember my baptism, every time I go to the Lord's Supper, I am receiving this message that Christ is risen and for his sake I am forgiven. By the way, this is why we're going to confess the creed in just a minute. This is to aid our witness, to help us proclaim the truth. And whenever we are afraid, all we have to do is remember that fact and remember that at the last day, the truth will win out. And it cannot be drowned out even by the loudest and most lucrative lie. Is there any other God in this world like our God? Is there any other God like our God? No. no. Is there any other God who could existed before our God? No. Is there any other God who will exist after our God? There is only one God. He is the God who created the world, who redeemed the world, who sanctifies the world, and who promises to bring us to himself where we will live forever, and you are his witnesses. Amen.